The CO2 can come from many sources, but it's pretty obvious that over the last hundred years, all of that carbon we had packed into the Earth's crust through hundreds of millions of years of plant and animal decay, our fossil fuels, over the last hundred years, we're digging it all up and setting it on fire. So let's look at some of the CO2 correlations and how much CO2 is in the air. So here's a chart of CO2 concentration. And you can also see on this chart temperature. Now there's some very interesting scales here. The time scale along the bottom is in years before present, kilo years before present. So the part that's at zero on the left, that's now. The part that's at 20 or 40 is 20 and 40,000 years ago. The temperature scale looks at uh, a zero perhaps of now and looks at what the temperature change was. And you see that 20,000 years ago we were in what was called the ice age. And the temperature was 10 degrees centigrade less than it is now. That's a huge temperature change. You can also look at the CO2 concentration. The scale's over here on the right, and it's not a scale that, that has zero all the way at the bottom. And if you look at these charts, you can see a very clear correlation between the temperature and the carbon dioxide. When you're presented with data like this, you should ask a whole lot of questions. Hey, who was this person 20,000 years ago in the Ice Age that wrote down these temperatures? And, and how did they measure parts per million of carbon dioxide? Very good questions. And I have some very good answers. The carbon dioxide is fascinating. Did you know Antarctica is a desert? You say, Wait a minute, the Sahara is a desert. That is not a desert. It's not hot and sandy. No. Desert means no rainfall or very, very low precipitation. And in Antarctica, there is very little precipitation. It snows only occasionally. When it does snow, it never melts. So that snow is sitting on the ground. Next year, some more snow falls on top. Next year, some more snow. Over a hundred years, a lot of snow has fallen. None of it has melted. It's compacted and turned into ice. In that process of turning into ice, small air bubbles are trapped in the ice. That air is from whenever that ice was formed. Then it can't get out. This continues thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. If you want to know what the atmosphere looks like a thousand years ago, dig down a foot into the ice. 10,000 years, maybe 10 feet. You take a core sample of the ice, and then you can slice out the ice, and you're slicing out a time slice of history. If you now, under very controlled conditions, melt that ice, release the trapped gas, you can determine what the gas composition of the atmosphere was. Fascinating stuff. The temperature is a little more complicated. Certain plants only live in certain temperatures. You're not going to have some beautiful bougainvillea on the North Pole, right? So you're always going to have a case where the temperature and the plants that grow there are correlated. So how do you go back in time? Well, you look at the fossil record. You say, fossilized plants? Oh, that's got to be pretty rare. No, no, no. Fossilized pollen. Yeah, there's an exciting study. Let's go dig up tiny little pieces of pollen from across the strata and find out what the temperature was or must have been, what range it must have been in that location at that point in time. Radioactive carbon dating can give you a date. You can look at the pollen distributions and you can get a good idea, completely independent from the ice core data of what the temperature would be like over the past thousands of years. You put those two correlations together and they fit very vividly. The thing is that these data points are, uh, well, a thousand years wide. And we're not living in a thousand year time span. We're living in a 
now, day to day, year to year time span, and we say, well, will temperature and CO2 correlate in this time span? So let's look at some more recent data. Here is the carbon dioxide concentration taken at a location in Hawaii on top of an extinct volcano. And you can see that the band range from the last graph is in this, oh, a um, little below 200 to a little below 300 range. And today's carbon dioxide levels are in this 300 to 360, 380, very close to 400 parts per million today, almost double of this historic range. What's likely to happen? Well, it sure depends on how quickly we burn carbon fuels. The more carbon fuels we burn, the more CO2 will go into the atmosphere. If we just continue at a steady rate, we will just have a continually steady rate of rise of CO2 in the atmosphere. If, on the other hand, we start using even more and more fossil fuels, because the world wants more energy and that's the easiest way to get that energy, then we will have an even greater amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere. There are ways, of course, to prevent this. You could take a lot of energy resources that are not carbon-based. Wind, solar, nuclear power. The transition to those, of course, is taking time. So for the foreseeable future, we will be putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the huge question is, how will it affect the temperature? Well, one of the things we can do is actually look at the temperature change. Not the thousand year thing from fossilized pollen, but rather the year to year change from actually taking records, from actually measuring the temperature across the planet, from measuring it in atmospheric balloons that are weather balloons. A lot of ways, and, and of course some of these are not precise, but we get enough measurements, we try to make sure that these are the accurate measurements, that we don't take them next to air conditioner outlets, we don't take them in the middle of a hot black parking lot at midday, right? Try to honestly and effectively get these temperature measurements. You do that, you will see over the last hundred years or more of record taking that the average temperature of the Earth has increased. The increase is about 0.7 degrees centigrade. And we look at the most recent data and you can see that there is a general still increase even in the last decade. But I also want to point out on this case that there is a very large variation from month to month and from year to year. It's very difficult to say, aha, see, this is CO2. On the other hand, all of the other aspects, oh, it's more solar activity, it's less, none of those correlate strongly with the general increase of both CO2 and temperature. So we have strong reasons, both from the science of how global warming works, and CO2 does trap in the heat, and from data that CO2 and temperature go hand in hand. As we make more CO2, the Earth is going to get warmer. There are questions, however, as to how much warmer it will get. And an even bigger question is, so what? How much warmth can we tolerate? When politicians say, oh, I don't believe in global warming, I don't, I at least hope, that's not what they really mean. Normally, what I've figured out they really mean is, I'm not convinced that we need to dramatically alter our activities because of the worry of the Earth getting slightly warmer.